story in every bottle. everybody uh, another Monday night with uh, with the hermits and with a new guest which I'm going to introduce to you uh, Iago I'll introduce to you in just a moment uh, but before we do that get th let's get down to some of the business we got to deal with the little preamble um, if you are watching us for the first time thank you thanks for joining us and uh, if you would like to subscribe to our YouTube or Facebook channel if you're subscribing to YouTube Right below Chuck, if you're on YouTube, is a subscribe button. Please click the subscribe, subscribe button if, we're, if what we're talking about is of any interest to you at all. And on Facebook, there's a little bell in the corner of the page somewhere. Uh, click that bell, and that subscribes you to our Facebook link. If we go live anywhere, which is almost every Monday night, and then uh, some random place around the planet other times. Uh, so uh, if you'd like to be notified when we go live, uh, subscribing is the best way to do that and you'll get notifications of our upcoming videos. Um, also, if you like the conversation that we're having here and you think you know others who would appreciate and enjoy this conversation, please share our story or our link to, uh, to your friends and, and family if, we, if you think they'll, they'll enjoy it. And if you're joining us, we'd also like it very much if you would make yourself known. So uh, do that by uh, putting a comment either in YouTube or on Facebook. Uh, let, you, let, let us know you're here. And if during the broadcast you have any questions of us or of Iago, uh, please uh, ask them in the comment section and we'll do our best to answer those questions on air. And uh, if we don't get to your question on air, we always review the broadcast afterwards and we'll, we'll do our best to get your answers uh, to you after in the comments. So uh, I think I've covered everything except what we're drinking, which is very uh, relevant to who our guest is today. Um, we're drinking a wine called Meredith Bay White, which is a combination of uh, kiwi berries, rhubarb, and what's the other? Is a uh, uh, peaches? That's right. Yeah, peaches. Peaches. Those really good, neat peaches that Ken found. The, the, the donut. The donut peach. peach. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. That's so peachy. So that's what we're drinking. And if you are uh, enjoying a beverage, please let us know what it is in the comments so we know what you guys are enjoying. And uh, uh, so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Iago Hale. Um, we have known you. Indirectly, anyway, we, uh, yeah, I had for a few years. Didn't get to anyway. meet you for a few years, but uh, early on, since we started, <laughs> sometime when we were at Hale Road, yep. is when we first met you. You've been uh, uh, engaged in a uh, project at UNH, yep. whereby you're exploring the kiwi berry uh, in depth, and we'll get into that. But uh, in depth, as uh, what you would ideally like to see, an opportunity to create a crop that farmers in New Hampshire could commercialize and, and grow successfully and have a market for. And I know you've been engaged in not only the farming side, but you uh, have been very active in trying to uh, uh, promote connections between people like ourselves, users, and farmers so that there we can build a, build a market in, in, the, in New Hampshire. And there's some really good reasons why you're doing that, and we'll want to dig into that uh, shortly. Um, but before we get there, I just want to tell briefly okay. how kiwi berries came into our life, because we like met... I would like to hear that story. Yes, okay. we met the kiwi berry before you, and uh, we met the kiwi berry because this friend of ours, uh, uh, Greg... Um, me? No, Greg Me, yes. Yeah, I don't know Greg Me. I can't yeah. imagine you wouldn't, yeah. Greg Me, <laughs> is a, he's a, a, a farmer of sorts, not a commercial farmer, but he's got his own farm, and uh, Ken has known Greg and his wife for years, and 
early on in like 2010, maybe 2009, maybe earlier, I don't know, uh, Greg had an abundance. He had tried these kiwi berries in his, he had like six vines yep. or eight vines, yep. some very small amount. And he, they just blew up. He just had so many kiwi berries one year. He called up Ken and said, I don't know, you guys are making wine on all kinds of things. Do you think you could use these? And that led us to experimenting uh, with the making of wines from the kiwi berry. And it's been a rocky, rough road ever since. Yeah. But uh, lots of fun and lots of, lots of learning. The next rendition before we met you is we needed to find a source for these kiwi berries. And lo and behold, there's a guy named Kiwi Dave, and he lives in uh, in Pennsylvania. We've talked about him before, and for a number Hi, Dave, of years. If you're watching. Yeah, I hope he just is. Just in case. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, Probably not. But <laughs> the show about two. I mean, we've got what, two people. Right That's right. That's yeah. right. We had seven. <laughs> We're down to four now. Anyway, um, Kiwi Dave was. He's probably the largest grower of kiwis. Absolutely. Certainly the organic East Coast. Kiwi, kiwis yeah. in the, yeah, in the east. And, uh, and he supplied us kiwis for a number of years. And we had a good relationship with him and we learned a lot about kiwis from Kiwi Dave. But eventually, because of the struggles that we were having with kiwis and the challenges of getting the kiwis from Danville, Pennsylvania to New Hampshire in a, in a fashion that was yeah. usable, we, we stopped that. Fast forward a few years and we started a relationship with you. Yep. And I don't know what year that was, probably 15 or 16. Probably about that. 16 was probably our first crop. Yeah. So, so, uh, so let's let's let me stop talking for a second, eh? and let's uh, let's hear from you. So, uh, let's start with just a little bit of background. Who who are you, and yeah. and uh, and how did you get to be in this place with kiwis? Yeah, sure. I'm uh, yeah, I'm at the University of New Hampshire. I'm a plant breeder, plant geneticist by training, I guess. Um, my interest, though, big picture, my interest is in the food system in the region. We could also scale out and talk about globally the food system, but thinking really about all of the underutilized crop genetic resources that we have on this planet that are not really part of the modern food system. Um, you know, our food system is, is, is focused on a very narrow number of crops because it's like it's getting narrower. Yeah, it is. And there's scales of efficiency about that. And there's just a lot of historical caprice about which crops got attention and which ones didn't. But there's an awful lot of biodiversity and genetic diversity that has great potential nutritionally and fits the climate and fits our cropping systems that are just kind of behind in terms of investment and in terms of research. So big picture, I'm in that kind of underutilized orphan crop space. Within that are many, many hundreds, if not thousands of species that Kiwi Berry is one of them. And I, I ran into Kiwi Berry first when I was a grad student um, out at the University of California, and David, that was an absolute production class out there, this was around 2004, 2005, and there was a old abandoned research vineyard near campus of kiwi berries, completely overgrown, wasn't being maintained at all, it was some old project that had been abandoned essentially, and it just so happened that they were ripe and ready when we walked by, I think we were talking about olive trees and peaches and other mm -hmm. things, and, and I tasted one. That, that's they, what that, they do that, to that, you. that you could be that for me that I could be on the planet for you know three decades at that time and I'd never heard of it I'd yeah. never tasted it and I felt sort of betrayed a little bit like what else is <laughs> what else is out there that people haven't told me about right. and at that time I thought it was interesting and novel I learned a little bit about it and just sort of in the back of my head thought oh, it would be really cool to work on something like that at some mm -hmm. time that's it. but didn't really think much more about it um, yeah, and then fast forward, ended up at UNH around 2012, and I was spending a lot of time driving around, talking to growers, extension agents, there's all kinds of amazing horticulturalists just in the woods here, especially in Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire, people who really have deep knowledge of a lot of plant diversity, and you wouldn't know it's happening because it's not formalized in the markets, it's not formalized in the food economy. Grow. We have the, the fed seed, nodes the seed and absolutely are, are pretty pretty good. And some yeah. of the, and some of those it's actually some of those guys, some of the growers for Fedco who had kiwi berries on their property and I, I sort of encountered them again yeah. and saw how well they did in this region and I did a little little digging 
and learned that even though I learned about them in California, tea berries actually have been in New England longer than they've been anywhere outside of their region of origin, which is China. All the kiwi fruit are from East Asia. But kiwi, well, the kiwi berry was originally brought to the US back in the 1870s and to the, um, what became the Arnold Arboretum, but this was brought in by the guy who founded UMass Amherst. So New England is the center of the introduction of kiwi berry to the country and from China. From China, because this was a time, the 18, 1870s, 1880s, this was like big fervor around all the Asiatic plants. A lot of them were ornamental, but you know, hundreds, thousands of species were imported in the US at the time because it was a big horticultural trade. Um, anyway, kiwi berry was brought in and immediately, within a couple of years, it started showing up in nurseries and on the coast of Maine and Long Island. So by 1880, mid 1880s, these were in nursery catalogs. And these were being sold, interestingly, as an ornamental crop, because they, they, they were put in the ornamentals. And so I think that set them back quite a bit because they yeah. weren't thought about as a fruit. As a fruit. Yeah. And these nurseries, they were selling unsexed seedlings. And I say unsexed because kiwi berry is a, as a species, all the kiwi fruit, they are dioecious species, which means that there are separate male and female plants, right? And without both of them, you don't get fruit. And without fruit. both of them, you don't get fruit. And if as a nursery, all you do is sell seedlings that you plant, very often people would get a male or a female and not the other. So a lot of people buying these things never thought about it as a fruiting species. It was a, a it got taken up in the early 20th century by landscape architects. You can think of like Frederick Law Olmsted, who yeah. did mm. Central Park mm -hmm. and who did do we have kiwi berries, berries in Central Park? We don't in Central Park, but we have in a lot, a lot of other plantings, and a lot of his disciples who came after him used kiwi berry as this what they called a utility vine in landscaping throughout the Northeast. So you couldn't go to any big estate of money without buying kiwi berry as part of the planting because it climbed up cottages and softened the edges of structures and was a really important part. So it was all over the place and. And it still is, it, but it's in people's backyards. It's this kind of, it's this kind of, you know, backyard garden plant that never really made it to the commercial big time. And it's kind of just always been under the radar. And so for me, you mentioned Kiwi Dave, Dave Jackson, Holly Laubach down in uh, Kiwi Corners down in Danville, they're real pioneers in this. So they've been growing these things for when I first met Dave and Holly, it had been close to three decades. And they'd really worked When out. you met them, so it's going on four or five I think decades. They're, I think they're up, I would say they're up at 40 years now doing this. And they had worked out a lot of the commercial, like how do you manage this crop? How do you grow it commercially? And then really proving its viability, its economic viability as a farm. And doing this without any support from land grant universities, like all the public institutions that have made corn what it is and has made wheat what it is and has made apple what it is and blueberry, you think of the millions and millions and millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that have gone in to making these crops viable. None of that's happened with kiwi berry. And that you have these farmers who are showing the way, like, oh, there's so real potential here. So I'm very late in the game, but I felt with my with my position at the university, it's like this is something I could take on. I could champion this. I could kind of formalize the research around it. I could make it a little more systematic, bring in what's known, and really try to open up. Like, could we have an entirely new um, sector or industry in this region? The same way blueberry. I mean, prior to the 1930s, there were no blueberries. There were, you, you wild harvested blueberries until, you know, Colville cracked the fact that you needed to adjust pH and we could have cultivation systems. And now you look at uh, globally, blueberry is I mean, huge. In, in the billions and billions of dollars globally traded commodity. Like it, that, we're just waiting for like, what's that next crop that could do that? And kiwi bear for me has all the right attributes that if we ushered the resources, we could make that happen. So what do you think in all the time you've spent with kiwi berries? I did this, I had the same experience when I first tasted a kiwi berry from Kiwi Dave. I was like, oh, how delicious. Yeah. And, 
And, uh, and anybody I know who's tried one feels similarly. They're just amazing. And they're so easy to eat. They're not like the fur on them, like the kiwi, so you don't have to worry about that. What has been the resistance of these becoming popular as a, as a fruit? As yeah, a, as a I, I, have, I have my theories about that. I mean, it's hard to prove. But no, of course. Yeah. Well, what would be the theory? I mean, you yeah, part, pay attention to it. Yeah, long part, enough. part of my theory is so early in its introduction, the first setback was that it was categorized as an ornamental plant. And I yeah. think that took the wind out of it for probably 40 or 50 years. And then you get into the 1930s, 1940s, there was some work around kiwiberry at that time, but that was also at a time where kind of the global, the global food system was really starting to unfurl, right? And you know, we were looking at genetic improvement of crops, the things you were looking for were, is it big? And does it store forever, right? Because we wanna hold it for six months and ship right. it around the world. And so there were some breeding efforts at that time, but crazily, the, the objectives of those efforts were to make the kiwi berries bigger and to make it so they could store for a really long time. And they don't. They store really well for a fresh berry. You can hold them for six weeks, eight weeks, which when you think about what can you do with raspberries, strawberries, like as a soft berry, it stores really well, but, doesn't, but it doesn't store like a fuzzy kiwi fruit. A, ki a fuzzy kiwi fruit you could keep for six months. What is the difference there? I mean, are they, is, was, the, was, the, was the fuzzy kiwi fruit a, a geneticist's attempt to, to make a northern kiwi bigger? Do we know? No, no, they're very different species, and these different species have inherently different characteristics about them. There's, there's something about the epidermis of that fuzzy kiwi fruit. There's, there's something about it's, you know, you think about the things that store really well, there's kind of husks or skins yeah. to them. When you get to really tender, tender skin like the kiwi berry, there's something that is not uh, lasting as long. There's right. something inherent yeah. about that fruit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More oxygen getting to the fruit. Yeah, exactly. The fruit. And, and so, I, you know, I think folks sort of threw up their hands. You, you, you look at the 50s and 60s, it's like, well, this is never going to be the apple. And it's never going to be... Easily commercially delivered to the customer. Right, right. We're not going to be able to grow it in one place, hold it for six months, <coughs> ship it around the world, and have this constant flow where every time you walk into the market it's the same fruit there all the time yeah. that is completely decoupled from season which is what we have with bananas and apples and so many other things pineapples and you know most, most of the fruit yeah most folks don't department. realize that when you know you're buying fresh produce you should not be able to buy that thing yes. most of the year yeah. and yet we take <laughs> we take for granted which is a, which is a miracle of the food system right but for something like the kiwi berry i think that that was a bit of a wall. Um, and so for me, I think the thing that has changed, and it's really been in the last 20 years, it's not that the biology of the crop has changed, it's not that the physiology of the fruit has changed, I think food culture has changed. For sure. For sure. At and least on a small scale. Yeah, and, a, and, 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 and at least in our region, if you think, yeah. if you think of the Northeast, um, you think of this, this sort of the merits that come around having local produce, seasonal produce, having things that are small but incredibly tasty. Things don't need to be huge anymore, right? It, it's delicious and it's nutritious and it has some novel aspect to it. Like those things, those things have cachet in a way that in the say early '80s, that wasn't that wasn't food culture, right? And so I think I think. I think we have, we've gotten to a point where I think we could recognize the value and potential of something like a kiwi berry that's been there the whole time. And it's just, it's, it's, you know, how can we, how can we make the most of that at this point in time? Yeah. Well, and then you have guys like Ken who's like, oh, I can make wine from that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. He can make wine from anything. He, he, and he does. <laughs> at some point or another, I think he's tried just about everything that grows. Yeah. It fits really well with our, our culture here because the Dogo crab apple was one of, one of right. our standout wines <clears throat> from the beginning. And it, it only came into our world because it was growing in the front yard. And as a decorative tree. As a decorative tree, there was, you know, not. A, a, it was even, isn't even grown by orchardists anymore as a, as yeah. a fruit tree, and uh, with the pollinator. And can we've they wine it? What's that? We've changed that. Yeah, I think we have, yeah. <laughs> we got yeah. A, an orchard in, uh, in Belmont who started up to, start to put, put 75 trees in. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. and they, they, they didn't trellis it in, they grew the strain as well. Uh, so, but that, we, we, 
like your experience with the community in California, it's like, well, what happens if we make an error? And, and then after chasing the fruits, like, why isn't anybody using this? And then it's, you know, now our, our, we, we distribute nationally, but the, the Olin crab apple has not become a global sensation either. I think and it goes back largely to expectations. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's, it, yeah, and, and another fruit that I think of recently, quince, right? We got introduced to quince and it blew our minds what great and wonderful fruit this, this is and the, the amazing things you can do with it. Not just wine, although we use it in a lot of our wines, but um, quince was almost gone. You could almost not find an orchard in the Northeast growing quince. Yeah. And we have the, the queen of quince, uh, this woman out of Vermont, whom, who's made it her life's mission to bring quince back. And so she not only is a producer of quince products, but she's, she's an advocate like yeah. you. She's working with farmers and orchards all over New England to try and promote it and say, you grow it, I'll buy it, or I'll find you a buyer. That's cool. Yeah. And that's, that's what you find, I think, as you get into this world, there are these, there's so, there's so much amazing work being done on the edges taking these forgotten and underused yeah. and underappreciated crops. And there are these champions around who are really, uh, there's amazing work that, you know, like as far as Apple goes, I, I, I worked with some folks at the USDA in Geneva, New York, who managed the Apple collection, the USDA Apple wow. collection, cool. and got to walk the their orchard. I mean, thousands of varieties. And you, yeah. you guys would just, you guys would just go crazy. Mm. They're doing amazing work characterizing these things, and, and the thing they want is to connect that to uses, yeah. right? That would allow this kind of path for, you know, channeling investment and because mm -hmm. um, they, they, it's it's nice to have those collections, but ultimately those collections are only valuable because they spark use, right, and spark adoption. <coughs> and, um, and and actually, that's that's a good good point relative to the crab apple. So we started using the crab apple in wine and it wasn't long after that at least two, maybe three other wineries in New Hampshire said, ah, that's a great fruit. And they started producing some crab apple wines. And uh, and as we share it around, we hear that a lot. There's a sentiment out there, oh, that would be a great addition either to a cider yeah. or actually to make a wine out of. So it is true. When something starts taking hold, there there's a potential for it to sort of blossom out of that. <coughs> And then you and then you run into the end of the honeymoon period with these things too, right? You know, you find some model crop and you're like, well, why isn't anyone doing this? And it seems so obvious it should happen. And then as soon as you try to produce it at scale or oh, yeah. try to deal with consistency of quality or any of these things, you realize, oh wait, there was a lot of promising stuff, but like the devil's in the details. Mm. <laughs> and for Kiwi Berry, the, the thing I was going back and forth on is <coughs> Why isn't anyone doing this? And I've learned over the years that the right answer to that is there's probably a good reason why people aren't doing this, and I just don't appreciate that yet. So my first my first take is always suspicion. Yeah. And there've been because very intelligent, very resourceful people who have you know forgotten more about horticulture than I'll ever learn, who have worked with this and have decided, eh, I don't know. And so that, that for me, it was always those initial years for me was I'm going to try this, but I'm fully open to the idea that it really isn't a good idea and I just haven't discovered why. For me, I'm over that hump. I, I think the th there are issues to be solved, but they're the same issues that have had to have been worked on and had to been solved for any crop. Sure. I mean, I, I, I think of, for example, if Apple wasn't a thing, right? If no one grew up. And you came in and said, I have this, I have this tree that makes this really cool fruit. Right? But And they would have been pretty funky. Like right, this is what you're gonna have apple. to do, right? You're gonna have to graft them. It's gonna take, you know, seven, eight years to come into production. There's a lot of disease issues. You're gonna need to spray them, you're gonna have intensive IPM programs. People are gonna look people would listen to the labor involved and how ridiculous the system and say, like, why would anyone do that? Right. But it's just so happens that Apple incrementally has gotten there, and we accept that. But all crops have all of those details and all those little finicky management things that have to be done yeah. in order to maintain quality and consistency. And I mean, you were mentioning just with your own work with the kiwi berry and wines, it's inconsistent. Yeah. Right. It can yeah. it can knock it out of the park sometimes, and other times, 
like, what happened? And he did the same thing. <laughs> well, and I want to dig in on that a little bit. But it, as we have a couple of Keeley Berry wines that we're going to open, and, and I, uh, Ben, our, our, uh, one of our winemakers here, just commented that he, he might want to just open his 2014 tonight. And Ben, I have a 13, so uh, if you open Let's your 14, it. bring it in tomorrow, and we'll, cheer, we'll compare the 13 and the 14 together. But before we go there, I had a couple of thoughts I wanted to mention. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I remember a scare around 2015-ish when the state of Massachusetts yeah. came in and said, we're going to make kiwi berries an invasive species. Yeah. And I remember being, you know, well, that was a time when we were really just starting to ramp up our interest in kiwi berries and thinking, oh no, that would be very bad. Even, I mean, even if it didn't happen in New Hampshire, if it happened in Massachusetts, it would, it would stifle the whole, the whole growth. And anything oh, you absolutely. were doing absolutely. would have been, would have been crushed. Why would you, why would you get into a crop with it? One of the largest states in New England is is kiboshing. Right. So, uh, so tell us a little bit about that and what happened. Yeah, that's been a that's been a that's a long story, and it's certainly not over. Um, there, there are certainly uh, groups of people who, despite you know, despite the ruling of the Massachusetts Department of Ag that it does not meet the criteria for invasiveness, there are people who are convinced it is. And so I think this is something that's going to keep coming over and over again, these kind of pushes to, to list it as an invasive species. Ultimately, so I guess a, a few things to get to be really clear about. Um, you know, our region's forests are one of our greatest natural resources. Yep. And so I, if I had any question in my mind that it was an invasive species that actually threatened the health of our region's forests, this would not be a crop that I would be working on or pushing. I'm confident that it isn't a threat. Um, and that has to do with the fact that we, uh, a friend of mine, Bob Guthrie, he's, at the, he's in Minnesota, at the Horticultural Research Center in Minnesota. He, in particular, has put in a, just an enormous amount of time looking through historical records uh, land use, legacies, to truly try to understand what has been the history of this crop in this region. And what we have found is that in all these places, these sites where it looks like kiwi has exploded. And in some of these sites, if you, were, if you, didn't, know, if you didn't know anything about the history of the plant or the history of the land, and you stumbled across one of these sites, it looks like kudzu. So I can understand, I can understand someone walking along. I understand someone having the fear of, oh my God, what is happening here? This needs to be fixed. The issue is, is that if you understand the land use history, you would understand that these places where it's happening, even though something may be called, uh, you know, uh, a conservation area today, 50 years ago, it wasn't a conservation area. It had been, it had been clear cut and there had been farms there, and there had been gardens put there. And in many of these cases, if not all the cases, these are very old vines that were actually planted by people, and the trees that they are supposedly invading are younger than the vines themselves. But if you were to stumble on it today, you, you, wouldn't, wouldn't, know that. you wouldn't understand that context. Yeah. And so I, I understand the heat, and I understand the panic around it, but in no cases do we see when kiwi berries under cultivation that we have any evidence at all of invasion into forest, of what invasive, invasive biology talk about jumping spatial gaps where you have plant and then a new population shows up somewhere. We see no evidence of that. We see big plantings that were planted and abandoned. These are vegetatively vigorous, so locally very vigorous plants. They don't move. So th that's that reminds me of the, the the place in which was being targeted as the as the justification for this was this resort in Western Mass in the in the Adirondack in the in the, uh, in the, in the Berkshires. Berkshires. Yeah. It was a uh, that was no longer in existence, but it was like you described. It was just oh, I saw pictures. It was overrun with kiwi berries. But this was a place where it was a, a wealthy. Uh, mansion at some point that planted in their these, gardens. These are the biggest space. These, these are the Rockefellers and these were the Fords and this is why this is this is this is the reason why the Berkshires is a hot spot for that kind of thing. Long Island is a hot spot for that kind of thing. The coast
coast of Maine. So there are a couple other, other places that there like are, that. There are small places like that, but in all cases, these are old, gilded age, turn of the century, massive estates that had their own gardens, had their own greenhouses, had I mean, huge enterprises. And I think the thing that took folks, very good care. And of I their think the, the, I think the thing that folks don't realize is how long this plant has been in this region. That you know, when we go up to Maine. Uh, Mount Desert Island and Mount Desert Nurseries. This was George Doors that stay. We located vines that are 120 years old. Oh my These are the original vines wow. that some of those that nursery then used. They're there. They're huge. They're in the trees, but they haven't moved, yeah. right? And so if you, if, you, if you were to walk and see them, you would think, wow, this is dismantling the canopy of the trees. Those trees are younger than the vine is. And, and that's, and I think that's the fundamental thing that I think people who are convinced it's invasive, that evidence probably won't matter. But fortunately for the Massachusetts Department of Ag, it mattered. Good. And that was a really, that was around 2017, they finally ruled on that. And it was the first time that I know of where the Invasive Species Advisory Group had asked for something to be listed and the Massachusetts Department of Ag said no. Because usually it's more of a rubber stamp process. Sure. The advisory group knows about it, and the Department of Ag says yes. But there was there was you know 300, 400 pages of comments of growers around the region, and and it just it just the evidence isn't there. And and I think you also have to take into account what is the potential benefit of a species like yeah. this in terms of small farm economy and diversification of the food system, and and all of those things and. All of these things are, we live in a messy world, everything is a balance, everything is intention, and you have to, if, if you take the precautionary principle in which you can do, you should not do anything unless a zero risk can be proven, yeah, right. that's a good one. we wouldn't do anything. Yeah. And so it, it, it always is at some level a sense of a balance between those two things. So at least for the time being, um, it has not been listed as invasive, but I'm sure that it will continue to come up in front of states. I was talking with my friend in Minnesota. Uh, there are folks pushing there for it, and Minnesota has very interesting invasive species uh, legislation, a regulatory environment where you don't actually have to have an incident within the state to declare something invasive. If, it, if you can show that it's invasive anywhere. anywhere. And so they're actually using the same sites from Massachusetts oh, no. and Connecticut and others to declare that it's invasive in Minnesota. Um, showing wow. things like one of the pictures is showing this vine that's taken over this little shed on the side of the road in the middle of suburbia that clearly was planted at some time. And so showing things, it's, 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 a, real, it's a real mess. Yeah, that's um, a shame. Are these like the enemies of kiwi? Is there like a no. cult out there that <laughs> just hates kiwis? No, I, think, <laughs> I think I think that so, and I you know I, I have to I have to make sure to say there is such a thing as invasive species. <laughs> yeah, there, like there, there, are, there are such things sure. as that come in and and really ruin local ecology. Some of them are from China or from Asia. A lot of them are from China, That's right? Japanese, Japanese knotweed, for yeah. example. Yeah, yeah. or <laughs> you know you think Oriental bittersweet, right? Oh yeah. So that's a really interesting case because Oriental bittersweet. And kiwi berry were both brought to the region the same year. Oh no! Kidding. 1878. Wow. Kiwi berry was actually disseminated much more intensively to nurseries than Oriental bittersweet was. But if you look currently at the map, there are these invasive species maps, right? There's a lot of citizen science. Mm -hmm. If you look at the current map of Oriental bittersweet versus the map for kiwi, Oriental bittersweet is taking over everything kind of east of the Mississippi, and it's just this big red heat map. Yeah. Where's kiwi berry? It's exactly where the old estates were, where, where it was, they planted. Where it was planted. planted we yeah. actually have, you're, so this is gonna blow you up, this blew my mind. We actually <laughs> found records that the state of Massachusetts used kiwi berry as a highway planting in its seed mixture. Mm. Talking, Buying kiwi berry seeds uh, wow. by the pound. There's a million seeds yeah. in a pound. Yeah. And these were spread up and down the highways of Massachusetts. This oh, was yeah. under Dukakis's reign. Where are the plants? Right. Where are they? Right? And so you had, it's just, if you really look at the evidence and you really look at the history and you, and you really ask these questions, we just don't 
see it. You think about Kiwi Dave down in Pennsylvania. He's been growing kiwis for 40 years, 20 acres. Think about the millions and millions and millions and tens of millions, hundreds of millions of seeds. Well, and, and the farmland that he's in is this very highly right. cultivated, you know, rolling beautiful hills of farmland. I mean, if it was going yeah, to like, spread, it would have spread. Where are the volunteer plants? Yeah. I, I, have, I have forest all around my vineyard. I've been growing kiwis. We now have had harvest there for close to a decade. I have no volunteer plants anywhere. So, you know, a managed vine where the fruit is harvested, like, we don't see that issue. Where we see the issue is an abandoned vine. Okay. recognizing it's centuries old. So it's a, sorry, it's, a, it's more than no. you wanted, but it's a really long no, story. No, it's good. I've, I've been and it, it took a, it took to a lot this. of my time for years. And I finally, once I had kind of convinced myself, you know, looking at the evidence that there really is an issue, I've really turned my attention away from that yep. and really to the work. Yep. What is the breeding work? What's the cultivation work? And my best the best thing I can do is to get more folks growing it, getting it incorporated into more farms, and that's that's sort of where I'm So on that front, I have a question. So first of all, there was a question from the audience yes. who asked, do you, is it a one-to-one -one relationship, male and female plant, or can you have one male plant and 10 females? Or yeah, no, it's a great question. We, we try to, so it, it is not a one-to-one. -one. Uh, Somewhere here. If you have a healthy pollinator population, oh, um, a one to eight male to female ratio is, is one, what, male, to eight one male to eight females. And so if you think about, think about a, a square in the vineyard, yep. right? So nine vines, you know, three, the males in the middle and you would have eight females around it. And you could take that as kind of the tile throughout the vineyard. So you can populate a whole vineyard using that modulus, you know, throughout. And that so, that, but that's we have a very good pollinator population. If you if you have a less robust pollinator population, maybe a one to six. Um, in some places, I, I know uh, Dave and Holly in Pennsylvania, they're surrounded by big agronomic agriculture. There's, there's a high spray area. Yeah. I think they have um, a fairly weak pollinator population there. They've actually, in some years, I know, have bought pollen and actually hand sprayed pollen oh, wow. and some vineyards in New, e New Zealand do that. They have no males. They just buy pollen and, and spray it. That's, you know, that's very expensive to do. Yeah, I imagine. That. He was showing us, he has uh, some trees located intermingled with the, and he let the kiwi berries He just grow lets the male, way up just the lets the tree male go. Oh. To help the, spread the, the, the yep. pollen from the, from the tree. Um, the, uh, the other question was, you're, you've, been, you've been working on trying to identify this as a, as a crop for local farmers, and yeah. I know that there have been some New Hampshire farmers that have, have a, at least attempted to adopt it. Yep. What is the state of it today? Have we got any farmers yeah. growing no, it commercially? It's, 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 it's really exciting, actually. Um, last year, about this time, I got a grant from the Northeast Sustainable Ag um, Research and Education Grant. This is a USDA program. And it was a big step for me because kiwi berry has been this very novel crop. Um, there's so much work that needs to be done on the crops that people already grow that for a new kid on the block to say, you know, give me some grant money too when no one really grows it, it's a hard argument in some ways. Yeah. But we got the money to do this and part of that work was to get pilot vineyards onto 42 farms throughout the Northeast. So we have 42 farms in 12 states that are trialing the advanced breeding lines that have come out of my program. And we're getting ready to enter the second season of that. So people are building their trellises and getting all those lines out to them. But a part of that is to train people in basic cultivation of these things yeah. and also to, to, great. to catalyze a first regional network of growers because there are people who do this, but there's no centralization to it. There's no right, information right. exchange really. And so to try to to try to you know initialize that community in some ways, that's and great. so that's been really that's been really exciting. In addition to that, I do know because of at least partly because of this work, I know of probably half a dozen folks who have vines in the ground. Some of them at the acre scale, some in New Hampshire. A lot of really progressive adoption of this up in Quebec. I've been astonished. Wow! wow. Uh, we ran a winter pruning workshop a couple weeks ago. In, in New London, New Hampshire, two guys from Quebec 
made the trip down wow. and they were telling me that they know of multiple people with 10 plus acre farms in the ground that have gone in in the last few years. Oh, that's great. And news. so they, they've really, they're really running with it in a way that we're a little bit behind still. They have, the, they have more land and it's, yeah. and it's more agricultural. Or, um, but it's happening, which so is what's really exciting. Of the 42 farms, what is the scale from, from on the smallest side number of vines to the largest adopter? Yeah, right? most. So almost all of the farms in this project were chosen not because they had kiwi berries, but because they were interested in it. And so what we wanted to do is through this project kind of um, take away some of the risk of trying out a new crop. So that's where a lot of the grant funding went. So most of the farms have never grown kiwi berry before. They are interested in it. They can see that it would meet, fit in their cropping system. We have a few farms, uh, particularly down in, we have some down in Maryland and in New York that have acre-ish scale. Acre, so you're talking yeah. hundreds of vines. Yeah, hundreds of vines. Yeah, so that would be on the small side or on the large side? That would be on the large side. Okay. And most folks, small if, side is most folks, if they have any experience, they have a couple, three, five vines okay. that they've played around with, but not in a serious commercial way. Okay. And so what we're hoping is to kind of get them over the hump with that so that they really see it as a viable enterprise for their farm. And, and I know over the years we've, we've introduced it to people, people get excited about it. People try the kiwi berry, they get yeah, excited. Yeah. People try our wine and see what the potential is there. And, and Matt was just mentioning that the, he works for Averill House Vineyards and they have oh. uh, some kiwi berry plants planted oh, on you. their vineyard. Yes. And, um, and I guess they don't have the right ratio of male to female because they haven't got fruit yet. But is it, is it a, sorry to ask, is it, yeah. a, is it a trellised situation? Or are these, these vines actually managed in a commercial way he or are they just kind just, of planted? Just answered that, 32 vines and uh, they don't know the sex, which so he defines that might be the issue. So, uh, uh, I would love, I, I'm, I'm sure you have my email, but, but Matt, if you want to reach out with me, I would love to know more about the, what you're dealing with there. We may be able to sort out what's going on. He said they are trellised. If you look under the leaf, can you see whether male or female? <laughs> <laughs> That's good, Chuck. <laughs> so, so one of one of the one of the first things I did starting this program. This was back before anything flowered. The vines were just getting established. Is that I went in and uh, did a lot of genetics work on all those vines to identify a molecular marker for sex. Right. Okay. So now, when I have a new batch of seedlings that I'm getting ready to move to the vineyard, I actually take a whole punch of their leaves. I look at the DNA and I can tell at that time if it's male or female oh, without wow. having to wait for four yeah. years. So yeah. all the all the lines I move out to the field, I know, you know. are female or you know I have enough males to anchor the vineyard for pollen. Um, and so in theory, you could look under the molecular skirt <laughs> of these vines and, and ask the question without a flower. But if you can get a flower on them, they're very easy to see. Yeah. So he, right. he did say, Matt did say his vines were trellis. And he did ask okay. also, is our birds a fan of kiwi berries? Yeah, so no. And the reason, the reason is uh, kiwi berry is a, is a climacteric fruit. So like a, like a pear or like an avocado or like a banana, it's a fruit you pick and then it ripens off the plant. Ah. So it's climacteric. It will ripen on the plant, but it doesn't enough. need to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so as a commercial producer, what you end up doing is you should strip your whole vineyard when it is, when the fruit are reproductively mature. I mean, they are mature yeah. physio mm -hmm. physiologically, physiologically mature, but you would not want to eat them at that time. They're rock hard. Yeah. If you tasted them, they had this like gross latex taste of bitter, yeah. they're awful. That's the time when birds will not touch them, too. So the nice thing about kiwi berry, as opposed to other soft fruits, strawberries, raspberries, other things, where you really have to wait until they're ready before you pick them, you pick these things well before anyone will want to eat them and then ripen them. That was the problem, maybe, with, with Kiwi David just done that with us. We've got to ripen the fruit here, because he always insisted, and rightfully so, based on what we were getting out of the... Oh, sure. He w ripened them on the vines for us, yep. and then we had like three days to get them here and turn them into wine, or else they were all just terrible. Yep. But they were delicious at that stage, because they were the sweetest you could ever imagine. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and Dave, in particular, has a, has a real sweet tooth with, yeah. his, with his kiwi, so he really wants to drive that bricks or that sugar level up, and, and to do that, he leaves them on the vine as long as possible. 
what we have found is we've run studies where we have harvested kiwi berries at different stages of ripeness, mm. brought them in and ripened them, and what we found is that you really don't gain anything in terms of sugar content by waiting. What's what's the maximum Brix that, that you've seen then? Oh, in my vineyard, we've had it in the 30s. The 30s. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. But we but we harvest at eight bricks. Okay. You harvest at eight. Harvest at and, eight and bricks, and, it'll, and, it, and it'll and drive up. Our Geneva wow. 3 variety, which is the passion popper, Geneva 3 variety, will get up into the mid-20s easily. Harvest it at eight, and then Boom. do everything the else. Mid-20s is about right for wine. Yeah. yeah. And so that's 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 part of the that's you know these are the these are the details that are going to either derail a cropping system or not like figuring out how to efficiently deal with acres of things without picking soft fruit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's that, I've I've heard that story from others as well that, that that's an that's an issue. But again, like you said, it's working it out. It's getting experience with it and figuring out how to make it fit into the system. Exactly. Um, we don't have, believe it or not, much time left. What? Yeah, we've we've got to talk about this. So we've got to talk about this. What, what's so this here? Let's talk about kiwi and wine. Okay. Because uh, that's what... Which I know nothing about. Let's spend the next couple minutes talking right. about what we've done with kiwis and, and what potentially might be the future. Because I think there is one. And this just proved it to me. Mm -hmm. um, so we started making kiwi berry wines early on and struggled with our ability we always liked we love the wine the character the flavor mm -hmm. but we struggled with what would happen after we bottled yeah. and the s throwing sediment which was never an issue in the taste it always was fine that it didn't affect the taste of the wine but it affected the the appearance which the customer then uh, has has misgivings about but this wine is a kiwi berry wine made in 2013 so 11 years ago this has been sitting in a bottle for 11 years. Smell the fruit on this. As a fruit wine. Oh no. This, this is big kiwi berry fruit on the nose. It's just so fresh. It sm smells fresh like we just brought kiwi berries into the into the vineyard. I mean into the That's amazing. Yeah. It's yeah, just, it is pineapple. It's very it's pineapple. pineapple. Yeah. And it's lost when when we first made this wine it had a, a really very, pineapple. Really actually. pineapple. It's really pineapple. <laughs> now that you it say had that. a very bitter the kiwi uh, when we first made it, it has a tendency to have this a very acidic kind of bitter mm -hmm. finish on it that would that would yep. chase the wine down. I mean, initially it's always been a really nice, more kiwi flavor than pineapple in this wine, but it was it always finished kind of harsh and it just you know it was really mm -hmm. hard to get the right balance and to 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 make it you know so that it was sellable in a year and, and whatever. And eleven years later, this one that was probably a little overbearing eleven years ago. It's phenomenal. It's mellowed out a lot. It's really mellowed out. And could probably continue to age. Yeah. It's probably got some more years in it. Yeah, I, I don't think it's going anywhere. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Oh, I mean, it's fantastic. that's what is so, such amazing, amazing chemistry in this fruit, that it, it does these amazing things. Yeah. It does these very severe shifts in flavor. So that, that's something that, that's worrisome to a winemaker, okay. you know, so we, we try and keep the fruit in tank as long as possible, let it go through its cycles in tank. But that hasn't ha helped that much. Once it goes in a bottle, it still wants to find a mind of its own. And, and yet it, it can age for, for 11 years in the yeah. bottle and still continue to produce interesting and fun flavor. So why fun did it flavor. last so long in the bottle? I mean, this is uh, 13% or something like that, say. It's, it's not dry, it's not sweet. Yeah, it's dry. Is it, are there a lot of antioxidants in the, in the skin and the fruit itself? Very much so, and it's, it's yeah, I, I don't envy I don't envy you guys dealing with this on a wine level because I, I I deal with this just in a fresh fruit tasting right. level. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you've tasted enough kiwi berries to know that if you're off by a day or two of when you pop it in your mouth, it's the difference mm. between a really wonderful experience and you're looking for something to spit it out. Yeah. Right? It's right. It, it, in the window. The window in which it is a, a glorious taste experience is, is small, and so you have to really, for me, it's a real feel thing of knowing when of knowing yeah, when they're right. right. Squeezing this, yeah, like an apple. And that might be another reason why commercially, you, you, you're talking about the struggles with commercial. I mean, if that window is that small, yep. does the the farmer really want to, you know, uh oh, I got to get to farmers market this weekend, or else I'm not going to have kiwis to sell. So this this is why I think part of the education around it is I I, I think it's a mistake for a producer 
to think that their job is to have a, uh, a clamshell or a container of ready to eat kiwi berries for the consumer. I think we need to train the consumer of how to take kiwi berries home and check them for ripeness the way we do with avocados and bananas. Oh, sure. And avocados things. have a pretty short window too, Exactly. Right? And so you, you buy avocados, you, you buy them before they're ready to eat, you put them on the counter, and then you every other day you kind of say, it's like, oh, now it's ready. Yeah. And then that's when you eat it. And, I, and, I, and I, I, I think the future of this fruit is around the education of the consumer. Mm. Because trying to dial this in so that someone can just pick it up and just start eating mindlessly, we're a long way from there yeah, yeah, with, yeah. This, with this particular product. But then I think if you just talk about winemaking and then all the other processes that happen and everything biochemically that's happening, I think you, you're dealing with so many more dimensions of complexity there Clearly. of figuring that out. Like season to season, yeah. Was the batch where was the batch of kiwi berries in their ripening process when you used when, them? Right. Yeah, and Ken's always been a fan of, of you know peak bricks for yep. for for fruit. Um, I do remember that. I mean, I, I know so there's another variety called ananas naya, which means little pineapple, ah, which is yeah. like it's a nice sort of. This uh, one does it say what it is? It just it's ninety nine point four percent kiwi wine, yeah. and 06 percent apple wine. So and, this is a blend. and these were from Dave, probably. Yeah, these yes, were, this yes. would so, have definitely yeah, been. Yeah, so I Dave. think I, my understanding is Dave, at least now, is almost entirely Passion Popper or Geneva 3. But at the time, I mean, 14 years ago, 13 years ago when this was made, had a lot of Ananas Naya in the vineyard. Oh. Well, maybe that's and what so he maybe that's he some did of the have more apples. than one variety. When we yes. bought him, we bought two varieties. Yeah, so he had this Aloha Ana he talked about. That was the Ana Nasnaya. I'll bet you that's what that is. Cause and Ana is such a difficult variety because one year it'll be fantastic. The next year it'll have these awful metallic off flavors to it, and it's just very finicky. This is one of the reasons why I don't <laughs> This may be why it. we stopped making it. And I think it. this is what Dave, at this point, my understanding is he's pulled it out of the vineyard. And so he's almost entirely passion popper, yeah. he and Holly, yeah. at, at, because it, the passion popper of the Geneva is just much more consistent. So think of, tell me what you think about the difference. So this was, first of all, he's changed the blend. So it was a mostly 100% mm. kiwi with that. That is so good. And this is a... a that's, really good. that's really good. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so bravo. Yeah. This was a greater degree peach and rhubarb yeah. than the apple in that. So yeah. one of his efforts obviously was to cut the kiwi back just a little more. Yeah. And you can see the color difference, although a lot of that color, as you pointed out earlier, this was more like that color oh, in well, so this, so this it has, has really- It did have more of a yellow up. character, okay. but the yellowing has gotten much darker over the years as it's aged. And that's oxidation probably, because yeah. there is integration through the cork of air. So, uh, but it, it, this has a, a, a different color from what, what that was at the beginning. That had a yellow, yellowish. This has more of a clear, clear look to it. Wow. But isn't that, that is just isn't really that amazing? amazing? I just, it blows me away. It's, I'm sad that was my last bottle. I think I have some more in the warehouse. <laughs> oh, no. no, I have some, we have some more of that. And we have, I wish I had thought of this earlier, but there, there is, I believe there's still at least a couple bottles of the year before this that were clear. And really that are still clear to this day i'm pretty sure i'm going to check on that i'll get back to you on that i'll check with it would ken be interesting to know if, if we could dig in the records of what the what the variety mixture yeah. was yeah. there ken has all the notes he's a scientist he knows mm. everything bob and i know That's nothing delicious yeah no, no, we know nothing except how to drink we're yeah. good at that um what is this one here Passion pop. Let's see. Oh, that's, this is, that's is this the dessert the rich wine? Organic I think that's bottle. 15. That's the dessert wine. Yeah. And I think this one's fast. What was this fast. made, Bob? I think that's 15. 15, yeah. So it's really oxidized. It's still, you still get it uh, drinkable, but it's, it's definitely What was definitely the past. appearance at the time? It was pretty similar, I think. Not maybe no, it was, it was lighter. It was definitely lighter. But this is a super, super high concentration of kiwi. Okay. So we didn't use, I don't believe he added water. And if he did, he added a very small yeah, amount. I'll grab another. Yeah, I'll grab a new glass. Grab a new glass. Yeah. I don't want to rush through my pineapple there. <laughs> yeah, that was a real treat. Oh, thank you. Honestly, the, the, the 2013 kiwi. I can't believe we still have any of that left. What was wrong with us? I thought we were in the business to sell wine. What is that? Yet we hung on to it. This has, this has like marshmallow, 
Yeah. And uh, it has a burnt character, it's a mm -hmm. sort of a toasty character to it. Oh, it's it, there's a little bit of like uh, there's a little glue. There's still there's like a t hint of That's this sort of uh, model glue, and it's yeah. always been there. That's not new to this being oh, old. Yeah. There's always been this little hint of model glue. It, it's not just in kiwi. We have that hint in some uh, some grape wines. We'll have that <laughs> as well. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, although it can be. Yeah. So there is got this is usual to, to me. My expectation. Is a is a, a much richer, um, um, like super concentrated um, kiwi berry flavor, and this is it's more softening. of an oxidized version. It's blending of, together, yeah. sort of coming. It's yeah. got more of the 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 oxidative side of the, yeah. the fruit. That's it's not quite as interesting as it, as it has been at some point. This is some of the the flavor that I always associate. I've, I've drunk a lot of bad kiwi berry wine yeah. and different people have tried things and thus yeah. this has some of those yeah. those off tastes to it yeah. under, which is not in... No, which I was though. so surprised yeah. by the Meredith Bay when, I, when yeah. I drank that. It was none of that. It was the first, it's actually the first kiwi berry wine I tasted that didn't have any of those things. That's and that's 100% your kiwis. So you that's, know about those. <laughs> yeah. These other two are Model kiwi glue. That is, <laughs> yeah, that's what you get, exactly right? Exactly what it yeah. is. Yeah, Duco is a <laughs> Duco <laughs> cement. It's, it's a it's a bacteria infection. Yeah. So, so, um, so I think this is past. But this this when this first came out, like the first couple of years, yeah, this was the most fun wine to drink. You literally you felt like you were you and not only the marshmallows, you felt like you were roasting marshmallows by the fire, but it also did something to your mouth. There's a, there's a chemical or a chemistry yeah. in kiwi that yeah. I forget what it what the feeling is, but there's this really strange sensation that occurs. You well, know what there's I'm talking about? There's actinidin in kiwi, which is actually uh, oh, it's a uh, it's an enzyme. It's a tenderizing enzyme. So you can use kiwi berry juice like you would pineapple juice to tenderize meats. Oh wow! Oh, it's a what? it's a protonase. Wow. And so it has a, and it may very well have. Tenderizing my mouth. Have <laughs> that, that may be, actinidin may be the thing that's, that's doing that. Maybe that's coming through. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't, know. Know. I, I, it, I don't get it now. I, I remember, I don't know if you recall, but yeah. there were a few times when we tasted cute beer and it would just do this weird thing to your mouth. And it was cool. I mean, I kind of yeah. liked it. I liked the, the sensation. Um, but the, the, mm. The point of this exercise and, and what I, how we can sort of end this is, end the show is to talk about, first of all, look at the range here. We have kiwi wine going all the way back in, a, in our cellar. We have kiwi wine going back to 2011 or 12. And, and we're still persisting today to figure out the challenge because I mean, that just this is, yeah. I mean, it's so, it's like there's something when you get there, it right, right? Yeah. it's yeah. amazing. It's yeah. really amazing. And, and this is, I mean, I, he got it right here. Yeah, yeah, if we could solve the, the sediment issue, I mean, this was fine filtered. It was crystal clear for a few months. Yeah. And then, boom, all of a sudden, it started uh, coagulating together and dropping out as sediment. It doesn't bother the flavor at all. It doesn't, you know, most mm -hmm. of the customers these days, you know, we, beer industry has taught people that cloudy's good. So That's true. It's, it's actually not bothersome to most you know, non-wine yeah, people, yeah. you know, yeah. grape wine people are like, oh, no, that's not good. They're not welcome here. They're not, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're welcome. We they're can welcome. turn them around, but that's if we right. can't turn them around. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to be converted. Yeah, welcome to be converted. <laughs> so, uh, but I know that Ken is, uh, Ken continues to be very enthusiastic about, especially since this yeah. release. Well, I, I, well, I know, I know too, uh, you know, so if you go to my, the research vineyard that we have at UNH, I have about, at this point, 2,000 vines there, and every one of them is a different variety. Every one of them is genetically unique. And so every year I'm tasting hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of fruit, and they, they just run the gamut from things that are divine to things that taste like pine pitch and grass. And so wow. like the, the, the flavor spectrum is all over the place. And right. so it tells me too that there's, there's, a, lot to there's a lot of work to be done. And you know, the, the, the fruit that I'm picking, the, the, the lines that I'm selecting for fresh eating may not be the right lines at all for fermenting. Yeah. Right? 
Absolutely. And and in order to figure that out, you know, you need a partnership of someone who's willing to take different batches and say, I'm going to ferment these 20 different kinds and tell you, I like this, I don't like that, I like this, and I don't like that. I mean, if, if we really are to try to try to understand, do we need to breed a variety that really is for winemaking? And that may end up just like cider apples yeah. are not the apples you eat, right? It, are we is kiwiberry that kind of crop where we really need to decide to invest in that direction and figure it out or do you just sort of make do with whatever the fresh eating varieties are and you know cross your fingers and hope that it's consistent i have a great idea let's hear it i think you and ken need a partner you need to start a fermentation lab and, and Ken can, can give you some guidance and set up a whole bunch of carboys, just carboy size. Is Ken going to come and run it? No, no, you have to do it. That's, that's <laughs> the partnership. <laughs> you and the clone of yours. <laughs> Honestly, Ken would run it. I mean, Ken, Ken has talked about wanting to do that here for years. Yeah. We don't have the space or the well, time we can to just send this the, out. We'll send you the fruit. How about that? But, <laughs> well, well, we'll see if we'll we can talk get about Ken on this. board. Yeah. But one way or another, yeah. I, I think there's some, some validity there because of obvious and success that one could have and i think of all of the you know the you, this could be delivered as a cider type product absolutely. a lower alcohol bubbly you know uh a cider characteristic to it it could be a wine it you know it it just seems like it has so much potential as a beverage and the beverage industry has a lot more ability to control harvest ripening and timing right you right. can we get to produce it when we want to produce exactly. it. exactly exactly so it does seem like a really great end result for this fruit if you yeah. could if you could nail the the solution to this it i mean I, I can't imagine wineries you know all over new england that wouldn't just kill to have if we could figure it out if right? we could figure it out yeah yeah, yeah. so it, and that's what needs to happen we you know it's just like i think of uh randall graham is he sold he's the he's the founder of bonnie doon vineyards okay and he sold bonnie doon vineyards and now he's just a wild man he's <laughs> He's, yeah, he's, it's so cool. We went out to visit him, and he started this, this vineyard called Popola Shum. And he's planting, you know, grapes are the same way. You have to graft them on. The seeds don't produce the same variety over and over. Right. So he's planting and growing hundreds of different varieties. He's just planting the seeds to see what happens. And yep. he's making, he has a, a bank of a, maybe 100 or 500 carboys on the wall. And he's making wines from each of the various different That's what seeds you gotta do. to see what happens. What wine? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. it's a cool idea. Yeah. It takes an enormous amount of resources, and you know, having sold Bonnie Dew Vineyards, <laughs> yes. Some but of the those big resources. schools do that. I mean, you go out to the University of Minnesota; they have the Agricultural Experiment Station, and then they have the the winemaking program, the fermentation program, right there see, on we site. Get doing that. Nature excited about Cornell this. does that. Like we. You know, to, to have that in New England, to have something like that that looks at New England fruit and what we can do with it in terms of value added and other uses. That would be fantastic. That, that's the investment that needs to be made in order to get past these questions. Now, so UNH just started a, a brewery, a, a fermenting school, right? That's true. We have a brewery, we have a brewing minor. Brewing that's, minor, yeah, okay. In our department. So yeah. maybe there's some wiggle room in there. And, and, I, and, and, and yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I think the bigger idea was, you know, can we talk about in terms of fermentation sciences? Yeah. Right? Like, what does that look like? And brewing is one part of that, but winemaking is part of that. Cider. Cider. Cider is huge right now, yeah. right? It's booming all over Kimchi New England. Kimchi and yogurt. I mean, it's like, yeah. you think about all the foods yeah. and, and fermentable ferment food. Yeah, fermentable foods. And that seems, that seems like a perfect thing to be doing. Well, it makes sense. A lot of stuff. sense relative to our philosophy here is that we try to make wine from what grows well in our backyard. Yeah. Right. So that's where we started. And kiwis actually grow well here in our backyard so that they would be adopted regionally uh, by uh, vignerons and, yep. and, and winemakers and um, the, the, the local uh, wine industry makes perfect sense to me. Yep. And on that note, we are five minutes over our hour. Apolog this happens apologies every to time. everyone. No, we can't help it. This, we, we love to talk. And everybody who comes on the show always says, oh, you're going to be here for an hour? <laughs> like, oh, my goodness. Like, oh, my God. God. Fill an hour? <laughs> Don't you worry. We're going to fill an hour. No problem. So, uh, and I'm excited. Maybe we have you back in five years and we have a whole new another conversation about the uh, Yeah, about we'll the, have the, the new, new program variety that's right. Or the new Vendors, variety yeah. or the new, uh, the new blend that Ken has come up with. And uh, we'll talk about it then. But until then, thank you so much thank for coming you so on much. the show. Thank you so much. This was great. And, this was sharing great. your story with us yeah, and absolutely. Uh, 
Thank Cheers you. to everybody. Thank you for Cheers. joining us. I'll raise my and, pineapple. Uh, yeah, <laughs> pineapple. I raise you one pineapple. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you. Uh, I, I believe next Monday we have something special, but I'm not going to commit to it yet. But uh, you'll you'll get notification about it uh, uh, on our website and on Facebook soon, as soon as I get a commitment. And I hope you can join us next Monday at 5:30. Until then, everybody have a have a great week. <laughs>